This is a great day to be a Christian. Open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. This morning we talked about the Continental Congress and how they declared this country free from England. We talked about some of the goals and aspirations that they had for it. And then 247 years later, uh, we're in some bad situations. We're facing some things. We have some problems. Prices continue to rise as wages are stagnant. Illegal immigrants are pouring across our border. The justice system is supposed to be providing equal justice under the law. Seems to be favoring the people that are in power. We just finished a month where homosexuals took over the God's symbolic rainbow that's supposed to be a sign of promise and made it a sign of pride in sinful lifestyles. Grown men in dresses have been promoted to positions of power in our government. Schools have been become centers for indoctrination instead of places for education. And boys and girls are taught, boys are taught if they want to be girls, they can be girls and the girls can be boys. And they're told, don't tell mom and daddy whatever we talk about here at school. People have joined the religion of climatology. Instead of worshiping God the Creator, they worship Mother Earth, and they talk about all the climate problems. Meanwhile, our elected officials seem clueless. They either mutter incoherent answers or laugh hysterically whenever anybody asks them questions about things. We've got problems. Everything is meaningless. It's all a waste of time. At least that's how Solomon would sum it up. That's what he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He said everything is so meaningless, it's all a waste of time. Actually. He said it in our Bibles in 1611, King James English, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1, and we realize that not that much has changed over the last 3,000 years. Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man for all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to its place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about to the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea. Yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that has been done, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that we're experiencing now, all the problems, all the bad situations, they've been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and one great American author named Thomas Wolfe said this about the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, of all I have ever seen or learned, this book seems to be the noblest, the wisest, the most powerful expression of man's life upon this earth, and also the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. I'm not given to dogmatic judgments in the matter of literary creation, but if I had to make, make one, I could say that Ecclesiastes is the greatest single piece of writing I've ever known, and the wisdom expressed in it is the most lasting and profound. Ecclesiastes, it's a great piece of literature but it's also true, and it still holds true today. We live in a time when everybody longs for satisfaction, everybody longs for happiness, and they strive for it in different ways. Maybe through education, maybe through the accumulation of wealth, maybe through work and power, maybe in pleasure, but everybody's looking for ways to get happy, to be happy, and yet they're filled with disillusionment, with disbelief, with despair. Nobody seems to be happy. Kids are finding they can't afford college and the ones that do can't afford to pay back the loans. Families don't have enough money to make ends meet. Big corporations are laying off workers. People are asking, is that all there is? Is this all there is? What is the true meaning to life? What's the meaning, how can I find true happiness? Is that really attainable? 
And we need to understand that current day America is not unique. It was like that back in Solomon's time. He said there's nothing new under the sun. People have been asking these same questions for hundreds and hundreds of years. So Solomon, when he wrote this, was at the end of his life. He was at the end of his long quest for happiness, and he concludes that life is meaningless. Look at Ecclesiastes 1 verse 3. He expresses his confusion. He said, What profit hath a man in all his labor which he taketh under the sun? In other words, he's saying, What good does it do me to work all day when I'm not gaining anything? It's not making any difference. I already know the results. He said the results, the verse before that, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon says his life has been wasted only at the very end of the book in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, are we given an alternative. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the only alternative to life as we know it. That's the only alternative to the life that Solomon was talking about. But for Solomon, it seems that this answer came too late. He realized he'd spent his life pursuing the wrong things. He'd been looking for love, looking for happiness, looking for joy in all the wrong places. And as a result, he'd wasted his life. And so Solomon's lesson that came too late can serve as an object lesson for us so that we can avoid the same mistakes that Solomon made. Proverbs 14, 12, a very familiar scripture. It says, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what Solomon is telling us in Ecclesiastes. Jeremiah 10, 23 pretty much says the same thing. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his step. That's what Solomon's saying. He said, I spent my whole life trying to do it my way. And now as I've come to the end of my life, I realize that that's the wrong way. That's not how we should be living. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes for us. We've been told in uh, Romans 15, 4, that all Scripture is given for our learning. We've been told that Scripture is given for our admonition in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says it's written for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works, so tonight, I want us to see what this scripture, what this letter, what this book that Solomon wrote can help us learn. How it can admonish us, how it can prepare us for our life here on earth. Let's go back and look at the life of Solomon. On the death of King David, Solomon was appointed king in his father's place. And he started out well. He started out with a deep reverence from God. Go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon's praying in verse 7. And here's his prayer that he prays to God when he's beginning uh, to take over the throne. He says, And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made Thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And Thy servant is in the midst of Thy people which Thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore Thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? Solomon says, I'm not worthy. Solomon says, I don't know how to do this. Solomon says, I'm depending on you. Give me the wisdom. Give me the ability. Help me to be able to do this. Solomon started off, he was very humble. He expressed his dependence on God. He said, I can't do this by himself. And let's look at the results of that prayer. Go down to 1 Kings chapter 4. Verse 29. First Kings 4, 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon prayed, God, give me help. Give me wisdom. Show me how to do this. And God blessed him. God answered that prayer. Now go to the 72nd Psalm. Psalm 72. And again, this is how Solomon wanted his reign to be. This is how he wanted his time as king of Israel to go. Psalm 72, verse 1, Solomon prays, Give the king thy judgments, O Lord, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. 
The mountain shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. Shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass and showers that water the earth. In his day shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endure. That's how Solomon wanted it to go. That's how he began his reign. That's how he started. He was a great king that cared about his people, that loved God, and wanted the people to do God's will. But something happened. Solomon strayed away from God. When you think that all Solomon had going for it, had going for it, how do we account that somebody that wise and somebody that humble messed up? Well, in Solomon's case, the answer was women. He allowed the foreign women that he'd married to turn his heart away from God. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, it describes Solomon's problems. Verse 1, it says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Solomon turned his heart away from God. He turned his heart to the people that God had said stay away from, and he loved all these women. He stopped pursuing the will of God, and instead he chose to please his wives, and as a result he missed the true meaning of life. Solomon found out that happiness wasn't in women and it wasn't in wealth. It was somewhere else. Towards the end of his life, he came to that recognition and he wrote this book of Ecclesiastes. Basically, Ecclesiastes is, is an admission. I messed up. Here's what I did. Here's how I messed up. And here's what I learned as a result of it. Folks can live their lives any way they please, but there's going to come a time when we're going to realize that it's about over and things are not necessarily what they need to be. We can live the way we want to, but then sometimes a brush with death changes our perspective. And that's what happened in Solomon's case. One writer summed it up this way. He said, death is a judge who questions the worthiness of our lives. Death is a litmus test, indicating the quality of the way we have lived. Death is a knife that divides the world into the fearful and the unafraid, the remorseful and those at peace, the angry and the accepting, the hopeless and the hopeful. And that's what Solomon was saying. He said he'd come to the end of his life and he realized that he'd wasted it. He'd used it wrong. And he's facing death as he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon's an old man when he writes this book. He realizes his time is short and he's facing death. And death is not just the defeat of his physical body. Uh, it's the end of his hopes and his dreams and all the plans he'd made, all the things he wanted to accomplish. He realizes he's, he's failed to do that. He was a great and powerful king. He'd been given great, great wisdom and he'd been blessed with great riches. And yet as his life comes to an end, he sums it up by saying, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's all useless. It's all meaningless. Well, what are some things that Solomon discovered were useless. He says there's uh, basically everything under the sun. Solomon uses the phrase under the sun 28 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and it refers to the worldly things. The things under the sun are the things that we experience here on earth. Let's look at some of the things that Solomon said uh, that he found out were meaningless that people seem to find, that we seem to treasure today. The things that we look after, that we move towards that we want to acquire and Solomon told us it was useless. The first thing people value wisdom and knowledge. Now there's nothing wrong with a good education. Everybody needs to learn. We don't want to be ignorant. God created this beautiful planet for us to, to live in and we need to learn all we can about it and we need to learn about how to deal with people. We need to learn how to prepare ourselves for life on earth but Solomon said that Wisdom and knowledge could be vanity. Look at Ecclesiastes 1 and begin down in verse 16. 
Solomon said, I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. I gave my heart to know wisdom. Look what the result was. I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Solomon says if you just want to gain wisdom, you just want to learn more and more stuff, there's going to be more and more things you realize are not going well. You're going to learn more and more about troubles. You're going to have more and more problems. If you're just gaining information to be smart, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your effort. The key to life is not found in the accumulation of knowledge. Number two, people value having a good time. We like to have fun. We spend countless hours and enormous amounts of money pursuing pleasure. Uh, Solomon did that as well. Look at Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. Solomon wrote, I said in my heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. Solomon says, I want to laugh. I want to have a good time. I want to enjoy life. And how did that work out for him? The rest of that verse says, And behold, this also is vanity. It's pointless. If that's what we spend our life pursuing, that's vanity. Number three, he said, that We found out today that people think there's great pleasure in drinking alcohol. They think, If I just drink enough, I'll be happy. If we look at the commercials on television, we see that all the alcoholic beverages are advertised by all these people having such a great time. They're all beautiful people. They're all strong and athletic and just accumulating wonderful times together. Uh, and Solomon tried that too. Ecclesiastes 2.3 said, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. Even that was vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. It didn't work for him. It's not going to work for people today either. Number four, people think they can find happiness in their accomplishments. Just look what I've done. Look what I've built. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4. Solomon said, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. That was all part of Solomon's pursuits during life. How did that end for him? It's all vanity. People think they can find fulfillment in possessions. If I can just get together enough stuff. Some people live by the philosophy, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Solomon said, pleasure is not there either. Look at Ecclesiastes 2, verse 7. Solomon said, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Solomon said, I had it all. How did that end for it? It was all vain. People think they can find joy through pursuing sexual relationships. Ecclesiastes 11.3, Solomon said he had 700 wives and princesses, 300 concubines. Did that make him happy? No, that was all part of the vain life. The book of Ecclesiastes deals with three basic questions. Why am I here? What's the meaning of life? And how can I be happy? And Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And that's certainly true of these questions because that's the same thing people are asking today. Why am I here? How can I be happy? What's the meaning of life? People want to know that and they're pursuing all these different things and the answer today is the same one that Solomon gave about 3,000 years ago. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The message of Ecclesiastes is simple. Without God, there is no happiness. Without God, there is no fulfillment. Without God, there is no purpose to life. That was true thousands of years ago, and it's still true today. That's why you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. If you're not a Christian, you can be tonight. If you are a Christian, have you wandered away? Have you started looking at things from the world's perspective? Are you trying to find pleasure in something outside of God's will? There's something we can do for you tonight. If we can pray for you, if we can pray with you. If you have any spiritual need, won't you come forward right now? We stand together as we sing.